Amen. All right, there in 1 Peter chapter 4, look at verse number 1. It says, For as much as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Now there's several thoughts right in this first verse. Right in this first verse, there's three good points here. Jesus suffered for us. And we should arm our mind. We should strengthen our mind with this fact. And how? It talks about from, by ceasing from sin. You know, the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Right? So when we go through, t through tough times, we can't say, well, He doesn't know. No, He understands our infirmities. It says, He that knew no sin became sin for us. When He suffered, when He was tempted, when He was tried, He did it for us. Right? Ultimately, for our salva salvation. And the fact that Jesus lived sinless, I believe what this verse is teaching in part, is that that judged them. The fact that He was perfect was judging the world. Look, it says, it says that the ceasing from sin, I believe He suffered in part because He chose to, suffer, to cease from sin. Now, we know that He's God. I'm not saying it's possible that God could sin. We all know that it is impossible for God to sin. It's impossible for God to lie. There is no unrighteousness found in Him. But He was 100% man. He was 100% in the flesh as we are. And He's here to give us an example. He suffered in the flesh, and He wants us to learn in the flesh to cease from sin. And it's for His glory, ultimately. And I, the world hated Him. They're going to hate us for it. Look at verse number 5. You know, so how do we arm our mind? How do, we, how do we strengthen our mentality? Look at verse number 5. It says, Who shall give account to Him? Right? This is talking about unsaved people giving account to God. It says, it says, Who shall give account to Him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? So the world will have to answer to God. And I believe part of that, they're going to give account of you. Of you, Christian. Of you and how you live. Of you and how you preach the Gospel. Look at the next verse. For this cause was the Gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Now we touched on this verse last week a little bit when it talked about Jesus preaching to the spirits in prison. But here, the application, we go out preaching the Gospel, right? When we preach the Gospel, we're actually judging somebody. Whether you like it or not. Oh, don't you judge. You're not allowed to judge anybody. That's not what the Bible teaches. The person that would say that, they don't know their Bible. Okay? We're commanded to judge. We're commanded to preach the Gospel. When you tell somebody, if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, you're telling them, you're judging them, that they will go to hell. That they are condemned already, as it says. So it's important to understand that we preach to those that are spiritually dead. You know, when Jesus said, He said, hey, let the dead bury the dead. Right? He says in, in John 11, He says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in Me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Jesus is saying this to somebody that's alive. And He's saying, though you were dead, if you put your trust in Me, you'll be alive. He says, And whosoever liveth and believeth in Me shall never die. Amen. Believest thou this? Do you believe that? Do you understand the importance of us preaching the Gospel to the dead? To the unsaved? To the spiritually dead? And listen, we should judge not only by the Gospel, but also by our lifestyle. I want you to understand what he's teaching here. He says that we should cease from sin. Right? We need to arm ourselves with this mind. We're going to suffer if we choose to cease from sin. If you go along with the world, they're not going to make fun of you. They're not going to ridicule you. They're not going to mock you. They're not going to scoff at you. Right. They won't even know you're a Christian yeah. if you live like the world. Yeah. But look, God wants us to preach the Gospel. How do we get better at preaching the Gospel? By ceasing from sin and following the pattern of Jesus Christ. That's good. And if the world looks at us and they think we're just a Christian in name only. Right? Because most Christians are just Christian in name only. Yeah, you're right. It's just a status, a category in Facebook, and that's the extent of their Christianity. They might like a verse that comes across their profile that's on the NIV. They don't know what the Bible says. They don't know what God wants for their life. They're not following God. They're, most of them aren't even Christians. Right. And look, we 
should be judging the world by our lifestyle because we've chosen to cease from sin. There you go. Look, I am not preaching lifestyle evangelism. I am not preaching repent of your sins to be saved. But I'm preaching to a crowd of saved people that want to go out and preach the gospel. So I'm here to tell you right now, according to this passage, God wants you to cease from sin to get better at preaching the gospel. Plain and simple. It says that they will give account to Him. The world will give account to God of us, of our lifestyle, of our conversation. We judge them by our own actions. This is why we preach, and to get better at preaching again, we cease from sin. It yeah. says so that they might be saved, right? So that they might live in the Spirit. He ends up the verse there. The point is that they get saved. That's the ultimate goal. And if we refuse to cease the sin in our life, then God is not able to use us as much. If you want to follow in the sufferings of Christ, if you want to truly be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you need to cease from sin. That pleases the Lord. The only way to be saved is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Once you're saved, to be used mightily of God, you need to cease from sin. This is how you help the spiritually dead. Go back to verse 1. So as men were commanded to preach, but how do we get better at preaching? We cease from sin. Look, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. So get the sin out of your life and be filled with the Spirit. That's kind of a no-brainer. Right. You either walk in the flesh or you walk in the Spirit. It's your choice every single day. Yeah, it is. And sometimes I think Christians, we don't recognize the power that we have when we choose to obey God on this point. If you walk down the path of sin, if you walk down the path of giving in to the lust of the flesh, you affect more people in your life than you realize. You may have a family member, you may have a fellow Christian that you cause them to stumble because in your heart you said, well, it's okay. It's no big deal. I'll do this one thing. I'll keep living in sin. But bigger than that, you may miss an opportunity that God has for you. You may step across a divine appointment where God wants you to suffer as a Christian, let it be known you're a Christian. Even if, if it's something well, they're going to laugh at you or you might be ashamed, God wants you to suffer and let them know you're a Christian maybe so you can get them saved. But many Christians today in the workplace, you just can't tell who's a Christian and who's not because most Christians are in hiding. It is true. Look at verse number 2. He says that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men but to the will of God. Now that you're saved, now that you're a Christian, God doesn't want you to spend the rest of your years following the world, following a multitude, right? To sin, toward, to do unrighteousness. He wants you to know the will of God, and that is to purify yourself and to preach the gospel. That's what you ought to do. Live your life for God by walking in the Spirit, by preaching, not lusting. Look at verse 3. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. He says the time your past may have, right? So there's some of you that are saved that you may have once lived this party life, right? These banquetings and idolatries, the lust, the excess of wine. He's saying maybe you lived a lifestyle that today the world would call the party life. And he's saying, that was then, this should be now. If you used to have excess of wine, you need to stop. That was then, this is now. Now you're a Christian, now you're saved. He says, Abom abominable idolatries. I mean, when I see that, it makes me think of worshiping the stars you see on TV, following the music of the devil that's on the radio, just acknowledging that and allowing it in your life. I mean, those are the idols that the devil has set before you. Yeah, that's right. Right? In the Old Testament, it was clear what an idol was. It was a statue. Right? It was a graven image. It was a carved image. It was wood. It was stone. And today, but it also compares idolatry to covetousness. And when the devil empowers a human being to be in front of everybody, to make them lust and covet after what they have, and to sell their doctrine, hey, that's idolatry as well. Exactly. If you listen to the radio and you think it's okay as a Christian, and you listen to worldly music, I, frankly, I think you're going against the Bible. Yeah, I think you're in sin, and you're allowing idols into your life. 
Now, will God bless that if you bow down to an idol? No, no. Will God bless? Well, I just listen to the the soft music. I listen. I don't listen to all that hard rock. Hey, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They work for the same boss, yeah. and it's not the Lord God Almighty. Look at verse number three. He says, "The time passed, right? Our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein." They think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you. He's saying they don't understand. And now their guilty conscience are like, well, was he, by him not doing that, right? you think about it, if you live that party lifestyle and you get saved, you get out of it, they're looking at you saying, well, he's condemning me. Their guilty conscience, when you decide to say, I'm going to cease from sin, I'm going to preach the gospel, I'm going to follow God, your lifestyle is condemning them. You are judging men according to the flesh when you choose to follow God in the Spirit. That's what a Christian lifestyle ought to be. And I, you guys know, I am not preaching a works-based salvation. If you think you have to be a good person to go to heaven, you're not on your way to heaven. Yeah. If you think that going out and living like the world will cause you to lose your salvation, you're not even saved right now. That's right. right. However, now that you are saved, now that you've received the gift of salvation, why don't you start acting like a Christian? Yeah. Why don't you start living like somebody that loves Jesus, that you're thankful for what He did for you, and follow in His footsteps, denying the flesh? They think it's strange. They speak evil of you. They talk bad about you because their conscience hurts them. They see you change things up, and all of a sudden they're like, well, if He's got to change things to get right, then that means I'm wrong. Well, he's just he's he thinks he's better than everybody else, right? Then the devil starts whispering in their ear to try to find a problem with you. Look back at verse one. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, remember he suffered for us for a reason, for our salvation. For an example, turn back to First Peter chapter three, verse number sixteen. It says, "Having a good conscience, that." Whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. This is God's will sometimes, is that we go through tough times. And that's hard to understand. Well, I thought God only wanted to bless me. Well, He does, but what if sometimes we get a blessing by going through a difficult time and learning through it and growing through it and finding, hey, I need to go back. I need to search the Word. I need to get back closer to God. Why? Because you're falling down. You're having a problem in the flesh. Look what he says in verse 18. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also hath once suffered for sins for the just, I'm sorry, the just for the unjust that He might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. He starts out. And this is just like what we just read, that He suffered for us in the flesh. It says in chapter 4, verse 1. The just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God. The whole reason He suffered was to cleanse us, to purify us, to get us to heaven, to make atonement for our sin. It says, being put to death in the flesh, listen to this, but quickened by the Spirit. Remember how he said, but live according to God in the Spirit? We preach to the dead so that they could live according to God in the Spirit. The goal of suffering in the flesh, of see, step one, clean up your life. Yeah. Step two, suffer like Christ did. Step three, get somebody saved. Yeah. And too many times Christians want to skip one and two. Well, I don't know how to get anybody saved. Well, have you cleaned up your life? Did you obey the first basic commandments He wanted? Are you suffering as a Christian? Are you really going through any... Has anybody ever looked at you and sneered, oh, you're one of those Christians? You're like that? Yeah, hey, I am. So what? Say what you want. I believe Jesus is God. I trusted Him for salvation. You can mock me all you want. You're the one that's going to have to pay. We should have an attitude of not being afraid. Go to Turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. We have to understand that the more that we reject sin, the more we can help others get saved. And that's not easy. Frankly, the flesh suffers when we do that. If you're rejecting sin in your life, 
your flesh is going to suffer. Yeah. You're going to have more self-control, but your flesh ain't going to be happy. Sure. No. It's no fun to go on a diet, right? It's no fun to not do those things that you want to do, especially things you're accustomed to do. But God wants us to be willing to sacrifice for the glory of the kingdom of God. In 1 John 3.16, he says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. Listen, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You know, sometimes God wants you to cease from sin so you can help your brother follow Him. So you can help a fellow Christian get stronger in the faith. Oh, but you know, that one thing, that's allowed. If my brother doubts, that's not my problem. No, actually it is. It is your problem. You're supposed to lead them in a more righteous way. And will you die to yourself? Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And there are some people that can't even resist temptation long enough to be around fellow Christians. I mean, I'll pick on smoking for a second. If there's some of you in here that may smoke. I'm not picking on you personally, but there are some Christians that won't fellowship. Well, I got to go. I got to go. I just got to go. I can't explain why, but I got to go. I got to get out of my car real quick. I smoke. Hey, go smoke one and come back and hang out with God's people. Go learn about the Bible, but don't let your sin be a stumbling block to you or your brother. And listen, if somebody sees you smoking and then they say, well, you know, I struggled with it for years, but it's okay for him, I guess I'll, I'll give it one. You know what I mean? We need to consider our own actions. Yeah. We do. You're in Isaiah 53. Look at verse number 3. He says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. All right. So Jesus was despised and rejected. Can you imagine being friends with somebody that's despised and rejected? Oh, you're hanging out with the loser? Yeah. <laughs> Think about what he's saying. It says he's acquainted with grief. Right? Those men in here that you're married, you are acquainted with your wife. You can tell me her likes or dislikes, whether or not she dyes her hair, the ends, the right. You think about Jesus is saying, I'm acquainted with grief. I have a close friend and it's grief. I know it well. I know what it's like. I know it from the inside out. Right? That's Christianity. You want to follow Jesus? Follow these footsteps. Learn to be humble. Look what he says. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. There are many people that had eyes on Jesus when all this happened, and they just shook their head, had nothing to do with him. There are many Christians today that they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They are saved. They're secure. They're, they're sealed into the day of redemption. And yet if it comes up in conversation, they'd rather act like a mouse and hide. Right? Instead of being as bold as a lion and saying, I don't care what you think about Christians. I am one. I know there's false Christians out there. I'm not one of those guys. Look what he says in verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with His stripes, we are healed. Remember He said, Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh. Can you imagine? If you had, let's say you had a best friend and he took a beating. Let's say he took a butt whooping for you. Somebody came in to pick a fight and this guy steps in. He gets a black eye. He's got a fat lip. He's bloody. And then somebody else says, I don't want to be around that guy. You're like, yeah, me neither. Wait, he, he took that for you, right? He was bruised because of you. He was wounded because of you. And yet some Christians, they don't want to suffer as a Christian. They just want to go along to get along. They want to be popular with the world. Look at verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. I turn to Isaiah 50. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. None of us deserve, none of us deserve what He did for us. None of us deserve salvation. But some people literally reject God and go away from Him, and yet here He's saying, I still died for them. I still paid for their sins. I suffered for them. He died for all. And yet, Jesus was armed in His mind. He was strengthened in this mind, and He wants us to learn the same thing. 
to cease from sin for the salvation of many. Can you imagine? I mean, what if Jesus said, yeah, but this one guy, years from now, he's going to hate me. He's going to reject me. He's not going to get saved. Why should I die for the sins of the world? Right? It's for the salvation of many that He died for all. And thank God He died for those. Even those that hate Him, He still died for them. And hey, I love Him because of it. I'm thankful because of it. Look what else He did. Isaiah 50, verse number 6. This is a prophecy of Jesus where He says, I gave My back to the smiters and My cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not My face from the shame and spitting. Turn back to 1 Peter 4. Jesus is God. He could have called down angels with a snap of a finger. He could have had 10,000 angels down there. He could have stopped the whole thing. And yet, He gave them their back. They whipped Him. He gave them His cheek and they pulled His beard out of His face. Can you imagine how much that would hurt? Right? They spit on Him. He let it happen. Because He loves us. He wants to teach us that we're going to suffer in life. It may not be as bad as He suffered for us. But we need to arm our mind with this same attitude. We need to strengthen our mentality. And knowing that we'll suffer in life, we have to see the value in suffering. We have to understand that God will use it for our spiritual growth and for opportunities to witness. And sometimes it's difficult just on the basic things in life. Just making it through the week or through a bad month. And doing the right things a lot of times is difficult. Yeah. The world's answer is... Well, give in to your lust. Why don't you just sit back and watch TV? Why don't you go have a beer? Why don't you give up on that lifestyle? Quit following God. When times get tough, we as Christians need to get spiritually tougher. We need to stand to this fight. We need to arm our mind. When our spirit gets downtrodden, we just need to accept it, glorify God on behalf, and move forward. And we're going to see, some, I believe, some steps here in how to get through suffering. As we read this chapter, I can't help but think of like a, a physical trainer. You know, where they tell you, you got to feel the burn. You know what I mean? You got to enjoy that pain to build muscle. You got you to do push-ups until it hurts, right? Well, as a Christian, your spirit is going to go up and down and up and down. And sometimes it's going to be difficult. You're going to look around and say, I don't deserve this. Why are things hard? Why is this not easy? And God has a purpose in it. And he wants you to learn to become patient. He wants you to, to get your way through it. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened unto you. Right? Don't be bewildered when life is a roller coaster. Don't act surprised when life throws you a curveball. God wants you to use it to grow. Look at verse 13. But rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Sometimes bad things happen and we don't understand. God, it doesn't fit in the big picture or the big plan that I had. I had these great plans for you and this is taking me another course and we don't understand how sometimes God is protecting us from ourself or from a situation that He wants us to avoid so that we can be used more of Him. But we have to maintain our stability. We have to be steadfast going through it. And look, he says, rejoice. You're having a bad month? Rejoice. God, I don't get it. I don't understand. But thank you. Thank you for what I do have. Thank you for the health of my family. Thank you. I'm, I'm sharp in my mind. Well, not all of us are. You know, I won't pick on you tonight, Brother Ben. <laughs> look, we need to take our part in this affliction that Jesus has had. And we will not suffer, I don't think, as great as Jesus had. Hey, maybe we will see the Antichrist in our lifetime. And maybe we will see great tribulation. Maybe there will be people in here that will die and have their heads cut off as the mark of the beast is laid out. Maybe that will happen. Because God's clear, we're going to see tribulation before He returns. Maybe we will have to endure some serious stuff. Yeah. Maybe not. Maybe it's just going to be a rough week, a rough job. And whatever it is, God wants you to maintain your... your your Christianhood. He wants you to maintain your testimony and not just be like the rest of the world. When you take part in the affliction by naming Jesus and saying, I'm with Him, He looks down and says, that's a great thing. That's a good thing. Yeah. And look, it's not just the beatings and the physical pains. Sometimes we will be despised and rejected as He was. Sometimes we will be mocked. We will be sorrowful. And God gives us instruction in His Word 
how to temper our souls. Look at verse 14. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Hey, when, when you're having a tough time, the world's mocking you for being a Christian, God is with you. And you may not see the results immediately, but God's saying, i got something so much bigger. He's got a reward for you in the next life that you can't even imagine. Yeah. And what if somebody gives you that, are you a stinking Christian? Yes, I am. That's As right. a matter of fact, I am. I actually had somebody do this to me one time years ago. I was in a political meeting, and I really like the things you're talking about in politics, but you're not one of those bleeping Christians, are you? And my initial reaction was to jump, like jump the gun, and <laughs> let me tell you, and I just... The verse that came to mind, where is it talking about if you're at, at a table with a king to put a knife to your throat, right? If you're a man given to appetite. If you got a problem with your mouth, maybe sometimes you need to just shut up. Sure. And I just call him, yeah, actually, just call me whatever you want, man. But I follow Jesus. That's right. Make fun of it, mock it, whatever you want. And I understand why, because the world is full of fake Christians. Oh, yeah. Full of them. I had a guy today that, no, I don't go to church. No, I don't have anything to do with church. Okay, never? Nope. Not raised in it? Nope. Two minutes later, well, I was at this church. And this guy started on money, and I'm never going back. Well, go figure. And so we're not like that. I, I don't want your money. You come to my church, I'm not going to ask you for your money. I'm not going to make you feel bad if you don't give any money. That's between you and God. Sure. Hey, tithing is real. It's in the Bible. Sure. You want a blessing? Go ahead. Take that blessing. Challenge God. Take him at his word. But it's not my job to try to beat you out of your money like all these other false prophets. If God wants to provide for this church, He's going to do it right. without all that. Without all that nonsense. Amen. And I told him a story. When I was, when I was growing up, I, I, went, I moved from different states and different churches and different schools. Homeschooled a lot. But there was this one year I went to a Christian school and to pay the tuition, I had to clean the school. This was part of my responsibility. Every day after school, I would spend two hours cleaning this church school facility. And I am not exaggerating. The pastor drove a Bentley. His son drove one. A Merce, what was it? What's the, the, the one even bigger than that? I can't remember all the fancy cars. Rolls Royce. They drove a Rolls Royce. The guy had thousand dollar alligator skin shoes and he walks in one day and I'm on the floor on my hands and knees cleaning the floor just to pay for my tuition. And I see his shoes. I'm just thinking, man, this ain't right. This is supposed to be the man of God, the humble man of God leading this flock. And it's full of hypocrisy and fornication. And I think God used that to get me angry against false Christianity. Yeah. So I can relate when somebody wants to initially scoff at me for being a Christian. I can get that. So maybe it's good for me to take it patiently and then try to find an opportunity to show them what a real Christian ought to be. That's right. You know, that's what God's called us to do, to preach the gospel, not to ask for money. Look, where are we at? Verse 14, If you be reproached for the name of Christ, Happy are ye, for the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of. Again, they're going to badmouth God when they see you. And Jesus told us that would happen. Hey, they hated me, they're going to hate you. Look at verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Right? How do you arm yourselves likewise? Here's a pretty good list. Why don't you fight these things? Being a busybody in other man's matters. Well, I saw that you went to the movie. Hey, what? Worry about yourself. Get your own house in order, right? You're sitting at home watching Netflix, tell, talking about your brother going to the movie theater. Hey, you ought not do either one, but think about it. Don't suffer as a thief or an evildoer. Look, it says you ought not to suffer as a murderer. It's funny, Pastor Romero posted this clip of Tony Hudson talking about when he was watching cops on TV. Did you guys see that clip on YouTube? Tony Hudson's this big old charismatic preacher, doesn't use any Bible, and he's saying he's seeing this cop with this 90 pound woman, and, and he's, Tony Hudson the preacher is saying the cop should shoot her, he should run over her, and then lie about it, you know, just to show he's a man, and I'm thinking, hey, what about not suffering as a murderer? How about you're telling a church as a preacher, you, we should just murder that lady? That's utter foolishness. Listen, as Christians, we have no business condoning murder. We have no business watching these TV shows where it's all about finding the murderer because that's all you're doing is glorifying death. Yeah, that's right. That is not godly at all. It's wicked. It is wicked. Look, we should suffer as a Christian. Look at the next verse. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, 
let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. You should glorify God if you have the opportunity for somebody to cause you to suffer because you're a Christian. <laughs> Brother Ben, those people that gave you a hard time because they know you're part of this church, it's okay. You just smiled and went on down the road. God will get them, and He's going to take care of me. And in 1 Timothy he says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that He counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry. Do you want to be found faithful? Yes. Hey, as stewards, we should be found faithful. And sometimes we have to stand in the face of opposition. Sometimes we have to stand up even to people that are Christian in name only and call them out. Call them out for their sin. Call them out for their hypocrisy. Call them out and let them know they're not even a real Christian according to the Bible. They're not a Bible-believing Christian. Look at verse 17. <clears throat> for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Now, hey, we are the house of God in a sense. You think about this. This verse, the application for you is judgment starts in the mirror. You look in the mirror and you say, listen here, you. Right? You say, you got a problem when you're looking in the mirror. Start with that, right? Pull it out of your eye first before you go help your brother. But if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. We have to understand this. If we would judge ourselves every day, we would not be judged of God. We would not have to be worried about being corrected and chastised of God if we would judge ourselves first and fix the problem. He says the time has come, the judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? God's going to judge you on the earth now that you're His Son. He's going to correct you while you're alive because you'll never go to hell. And that's just a small picture. Look, what, Imagine them, if it first begins with us. What shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel? What is the end of somebody that doesn't obey the gospel? Damnation. Hell. Hell. Yeah. Damnation. Yeah. Condemnation. Torture. Yeah. Eternal fire and brimstone. Suffering forever. It's worth taking a little bit of suffering now so that you have an opportunity to be counted faithful in a ministry, to open your mouth boldly and preach the gospel. Yeah, sure. And if they make fun of you, who cares? Who are they? Yeah, who cares? They don't pay your bills. God does. Amen. Answer to Him. Remember it said the gospel was preached that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. The goal is to get them saved. That they'll live in their spirit. We live righteously to demonstrate the power of the Holy Ghost. His Holy Spirit, through obedience of His Word, we have the power to stop sinning. And look, I'm not preaching sinless perfection, but look, we need to talk about this. We're all guilty. We all sin every day. But we can all get better. We can't just use that as an excuse. We have to choose to make things better. We're not under bondage to sin. We've been set free from sin. Now walk right. Walk like you're saved. Reject sin. Cease from sin and please God. Look at verse 18. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. Look, he's saying, if, if you're going through grief or sorrow, commit your soul unto God. Think about it. I mean, talk to God. Say, God, I don't get it. God, I'm having a rough time. God, I need your help. God, I just want to stay steadfast. And I don't understand why things are the way they are. Why it's this way at work. Why it's this way with my family. But I'm trusting you. I'm committing it to you. I'm just going to trust you to work it out in the end, even though I don't understand it in the middle. Help me to respond right. That ought to be your prayer to God. Help me to respond righteously when I go through tough times. Help me to grow by learning from the Word and doing the right thing. We don't want to miss an opportunity that God has for us because we're too busy complaining. We're too busy mouthing off or, or giving in to the flesh. You think about this. God has an opportunity to you, for you to do something big. And here you, you're talking to your co-worker, your family, somebody that God wants you to minister to, and instead you use it as an opportunity to complain. You're supposed to be glorifying God. And you're complaining to the person you need to witness to. You think about how unbalanced that would be. He is faithful. He's going to get us through it. Look at verse number 6 here. Here's the solution. Look, he says, For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. I want to give you a, a, a discipleship challenge. I'm, I'm serious about this. I want you guys to think about this. I want you to invite three people a week to church. Real easy. Real straightforward. 
We all talk to at least three strangers in a week. I want you to take a step out and be willing to take some suffering, if you even call it that, if you would dare call it suffering, suffer for Christ a little bit, and challenge somebody. Say, hey, I want you to come to church with me. I want you to come visit my church. Now, that's not hard at all. That's not confrontational at all. But you know what? What's the intro to your soul winning presentation? Invitation to church, right? If you try to talk to three people, you might have one extra opportunity a week to preach the gospel. Now, I, I want to call this a discipleship challenge because I want you to get people not only saved, but in church. Yeah. There are people that would be on fire for God if they were given a chance. Sure. But they've never seen somebody on fire for God that's sincere. They've never seen this a real zeal for preaching the gospel. All they know of church is the phony baloney, look at my fancy suit, give me some money, and that's hogwash. God's going to do away with that. Yeah. God's going to destroy those churches He already is. They're so, so full of hypocrites. I hate those fake churches. Me hey, too. but I love preaching the gospel. Yeah. I love the people that are in this church as imperfect as we are. We come together with this one mind. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to preach the gospel. I want to follow Christ. I want to, I want to cease from sin. That ought to be our mentality. Look, how do we cease from sin? How do we do it? How are we able to arm our mind? How do we handle suffering as a Christian? Look at verse number 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Now being sober means you have a clean mind. It means you have a pure heart. It means you're not drunk. And I mean you're not drunk off pills. You're not drunk off weed. You're not drinking anything you shouldn't be drinking. You are sober minded. You're not drunk off food. The Bible says eat for strength and not for drunkenness. You're not so gluttonous about your food that you can't think straight. But how about being sober in the mind from TV? Oh, I just want to sit back and uh, vegetate, right? I mean, the television uses a frame rate that's designed to cause you your mind to split into a, into a delta state, to take a step back, to have suspended reality so you unbiasedly, unquestionably accept everything that's being told to you. And that's how the devil wants to get you. I propose to you, if you are giving in to watching TV or Netflix or whatever it is, Hulu, you are not being sober-minded. If you want to be a, a Christian and on fire for God, be willing to suffer a little and say, well, my habit is to watch a little bit of... Hey, stop. Why don't you read your Bible? Yeah. Why don't you try to be sober-minded? It says, and watch unto prayer in this verse. And watch unto prayer. When you struggle... When you suffer, whether it's with temptation or tribulation, you should pray for someone else. Yeah. I want you to think about this. If there's a particular sin that you struggle with, when it, when it manifests itself, you take that opportunity. Man, you pray for your wife. You pray for your husband. You pray for your brother in the church. You pray for the people out soul winning. You pray for your family. You start praying for others. You do something selfless to get your mind out of this selfish mentality. Right? You're doing the opposite. You're doing spiritual warfare when you're praying for somebody. Yeah. Hey, we don't deserve the prayer we get. You ought to give somebody else that don't deserve any prayer. Give them some prayer. Yeah. Petition God on their behalf. Clear your mind with prayer. I really believe that praying helps you reset and get out of a bad spirit, out of a bad mentality. Yeah. Look at the next verse here. Verse number 8. It says, And above all things, have fervent charity... Man, fervent like fire, right? Be on fire about loving your brother. Be on fire about ministering to the saints. Get excited about it. Don't just shake hands and pat each other on the back. Enjoy spending time with your brothers and sisters. We're all going to see each other in heaven forever. We might as well have lunch together. Yeah. right? Most of your family don't want to have lunch with you. Hey, come have lunch with me. You know? <laughs> Have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. you got to be excited to love each other. I want you to think about this. If I found out Brother Ben was talking bad about me because my beer's not as cool as his, but I love him, that'll cover that sin, right? If Brother Ben got mad at me and hit me, if I love him enough, if I'm fervent enough about my love for him, I don't care. I mean, come on, that's, that's all you got. Right? <laughs> Let's think about it. Like, as brothers and sisters, we are going to offend each other. Yeah. We are not perfect. 
If you want to look at me, it's easy to find something not perfect. I can look at you and do the same. Instead, we ought to find reasons and opportunities to help each other and cover, cover sin. Charity covereth the multitude of sins. Around my house, we like to say peanut butter covers the multitude of sins. You know, ooh, this shake doesn't taste right. Add peanut butter, you know? <laughs> We've got to be excited to love the brethren. Look at verse 9. It says, Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Right? We ought to be able to open up our houses for each other. And many of you have. Many of you have been awesome at this and inviting people in and having people stay with you. And man, that's awesome. God looks down at that and you may get an extra little raise at, at, at your job or an extra, extra little bit of love from your family. Who knows what? God <clears throat> loves it when you help the brothers out. Yes, sir. Throughout all of Acts, we, used to see, we would see people opening up their houses to others. Hey, come on, stay here. I'll take care of you. We ought to have that same mentality. Look, verse number 10. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now, God is saying here that everything you own was a gift from Him. Look, the manifold grace of God. God has given you so many things that you don't deserve. And if, and if you dare stand up and say, no, I earned it, watch God break your legs tomorrow and take you out of your job. Alright, I dare you. Try it. God has given you everything. It's a gift. And now He's saying, be a good steward and give a little bit of that to somebody else. Open up your door a little bit for somebody else. Take care of somebody else that's having a hard time. And sometimes it's just a little bit of love. Just a little bit of hospital. Just a little bit, hey, how you doing? Like, what, stopping what you're doing and asking how they are doing. That's hard, but it's a big thing to sometimes for people. Yeah. It's huge sometimes for people. We don't realize. God gives you the gift of riches to see how you'll bless others. And if you're stingy, oh, it's my gift. Oh, it's a little bit of money. I got, it's mine. I can't share that with somebody else. God said, why should I give you anything else? In fact, why don't I take some of that back from you? God has given you everything you have, even the breath in your lungs. And when you give a little bit to somebody else, God will give you more and more and more. I used to have this mentality with Bibles. I would always buy Bibles and give them away. And there was a time that I was out of Bibles and I knew people that needed Bibles, and my budget was not looking good. Well, you know what? I'm going to step out on faith. I'm going to buy the Bibles. I'm going to give them to the people that need them. And God's going to keep providing. And He did. And He blessed me. And He took care of my budget and more Bibles. Now we got 100 Bibles sitting over there. God's going to make sure people get Bibles. That's just a small thing, but you think about all the blessings God gives you. Hey, we are a steward. This is all about stewardship. Look at verse 11. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. This is the last verse we're going to read tonight. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Now that's talking about the Bible. That's talking about the Word of God. If you're going to talk about something, it ought to be the Bible. Yeah. Now you've got to learn it first to be able to talk about it. Yeah. So invest your time in the Bible. There are some riches in here. And share them with other people. This is the solution to going through bad times. This is how we get through tribulation is having a good word for somebody. Sharing a verse with somebody. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth. We've all been given different talents and gifts in life. And whatever your talent or gift is, you need to use that to glorify God, to help somebody else. When you minister, when you serve somebody else, you do it through the gifts that God gave you. God's given you talents that I can't do and vice versa. How are you using it? What are you doing with them? Do you want God to give you more talents? Then use the ones you got. Pretty simple. Look, he says that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. When you suffer, hey, when life is hard, make sure God is being glorified in your actions. When you feel like you're at the bottom, you're at the end of your rope, you're, you've almost hit rock bottom, the budget hurts, work's terrible, family's fighting, just be calm in your spirit. Man, talk to the Lord. Tell God what's going on. God, help me to maintain a positive and an upright spirit. We have true joy that the world can't even comprehend. And when we let the things in the flesh get us down in the spirit, we failed. God's giving us some keys here to success and we suffer as a Christian. We need to arm our mind by staying sober. 
We don't need to daydream. We don't need to get drunk off TV, right? We need to be sober, clear-minded, focused, knowing where we're going. We need to show some love to other Christians. When we have a hard time, we need to pray for each other. That will help us be sober. That will help us get through what we're going through. Hey, and we use the example here. There's always somebody worse. There's always somebody, oh, I've had it tough. Well, there's somebody worse than you, and you don't know about it. We should be praying for each other. But I believe most importantly here, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. You need to study your Bible so you can share it with somebody else. Many, many times in my life where I would take a little bit of time and I'm studying something out and I get excited. Wow, that's cool. I just learned this. And the very next day, I have an opportunity to share that message with somebody that needed to hear it. And when, I, when that would happen, it always made me think, what if I was too lazy? What if I gave in to the flesh? Hey, what if I had studied more? What if I had gone the extra mile and stayed up all night reading? Maybe I would have had extra people to talk to. But let's consider this. Hey, if any man suffer as a Christian, glorify God. Count your blessings. Be joyful. Let's do it. Lord God, thank you for everything you've given us. Thank you for this awesome church. Lord, I pray that you would give us the wisdom as a, as a church, as a congregation, to make the right decisions about how we move forward and to stay in one mind. Lord, I pray that you would bless the events that we have coming up and uh, bless our fellowship afterwards. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, and close.